When Dior came out, we had to switch to emergency C-section and she wasn't breathing and didn't have a pulse. And the body kind of felt numb. Yeah. Um, things felt like it was going in slow motion. Not the way you want to meet your kid for the first time, right? Sometimes what seems like the end is really the beginning. I'm gonna take you behind the curtain of my life and my friends are gonna tell their stories too. I thought my life was over when I got molested as a child. Then I got pregnant at 17, and my drug addict ex-husband held a gun to my head. But only God could give me the life that I have today, and you can have that too. We're going from the pain to the promise in a real, raw, and organic way. Are you ready? Let's go. Have you ever been given a tool for a job that, I don't know, it just wasn't right? Like you needed a Phillips screwdriver and all you had was a flathead? Are you really impressed that I know what a Phillips screwdriver is? I know, I'm really excited about that. Or maybe you have a paring knife, right? And the job calls for cutting down a tree, so what you need is an ax. Or how about if you just have a little squirt bottle to put out a fire? You're never gonna put out a fire with a squirt bottle. You need a hose. Um, hello, square peg, round hole, this isn't working. Oh, how about this? You need to slay a giant and you don't have a sword or, or, or a gun or anything to protect yourself. All you have is a sling. Okay, honestly, this looks like a headband, something I would do with my hair, tie it all up, make it cute. It doesn't look like I would take down the things in my life that really need to get out of my way. It's not what I want to protect myself. It's not what I think I can get something bigger than me, like something the size of this tree. I can't take down a tree with this. Are you kidding me? There's a story of a guy in the Bible. His name's David, and I say it's a story, but it's not a story, it's actually history. So there's some history in the Bible about a guy named David, and he was asked to, you know, slay a giant. He was supposed to save himself, save his family, save his nation with a sling. The crazy thing is, this is what he was used to. You know, it doesn't seem like the best tool for a job, does it? Maybe it doesn't feel like you have the tools that you need to do the job in life that you've been called to do. Maybe you don't feel like you have the tools to reach your dream. Maybe there's some obstacles and some giants in your way, some giant size obstacles, some giant size debt, some giant size health reports, some giant relationships, some giant people who don't like you and you don't know why. And you don't feel like you can get the job done, but there's a missing factor here. And today we're gonna talk about what it is. You know, I remember when I was watching American Idol, and it was one of those seasons where we were just really involved as a family. Idol was a thing, like the world stopped because Idol was on and me and my family were in the living room and sure enough, Colton Dixon. And he comes out and he sings a song about Jesus. So you see these people get these things and you're like, well, they got the life of their dreams. Well, no, Colton's got some experience slaying giants. Everybody does. Even though he's had this highly awarded music career, even though he's gone multi-platinum, even though he found the woman of his dreams, he's gone through some major disappointments. I'll tell you what, just because somebody seems like a fast success, an overnight success, they might have walked through the longest night ever. Today, we're gonna show you how to slay the giants in your life to get the future God's called you to. Get your sling out. We're gonna go slay some giants. Rapid Fire Questions with Colton Dixon. Three words to describe yourself. Artsy. Um, hair. And... Uh, artsy hair and... You that face and I thought, smolder. That's smolder. Uh, I'm gonna go with nerdy, actually. Yeah, yeah. Smolder, nerdy, same thing. Yeah, same thing. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> pizza toppings. Um, I'm pretty boring, but my favorite pizza topping is pepperoni. Um, I am one of the weird ones that think that pineapple does in fact belong on pizza, but along with pumpkins. Favorite sports team? Hockey. Go Preds. I'm a Predators fan. Have been since inauguration, so Preds or die. Rapid fire questions complete. Does American Idol seem like five minutes ago, a lifetime ago, 
Uh, kind of both, lifetime ago mostly, um, but every once in a while I'll think about something and I'm like, wow, that really feels like yesterday. Can't believe 11 years have gone by. Just to, to kind of get into your story, what was like the journey to Idol? Like had yeah. you been trying to get into music? What, was it just a fluke thing or? Man, I first of all grew up uh, in church and uh, I feel like a lot of musicians or artists say that they, they're on music all the time in church. And, and so I just loved music. and. But it wasn't until 13 that I really felt called to music, um, which was kind of a crazy story. I loved sports, so I was a sports kid. <laughs> but then at 13, I um, had been taking piano lessons for a few years, and my uh, teacher told me as I showed up to the piano recital that I was going to sing that night as well. Oh, Terrible idea for a 13-year-old boy, just saying. <laughs> no. um, but I did. I sang I Can Only Imagine by Mercy Me and really felt God put it on my heart that wow. music was going to be a tool that he used in my life to reach people. And, and uh, yeah, started pursuing music and writing songs. And, and uh, then American Idol happened, wasn't on my radar at all. We were a family that watched, loved it, tuned in every week, devastated when our favorites were voted off yes. early. And, um, but my sister, uh, who's three years younger, really wanted to go audition. So we went kind of for her. She convinced me at, through the process and, and, it happened. Crazy, crazy, crazy. And you, what, ended up top seven. Seven, yeah. And then you got voted off. Yeah. <laughs> Sad day. And you're, <laughs> what, nine, 19, 20 years old? Yeah, uh, 20 at the time. Yeah, tough pill to swallow. Um, you know, it's funny, though. Um, I actually feel like I had a, a very faith-based, uh, you know, group voting for me on the show, um, which was so nice. Um, but there, that last week, um, picked a song I probably shouldn't have. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard. You have to pick songs from a list this short. Oh, so, really? Yeah. Wow. Um, but, uh, but I did. I did a song, looking back, probably shouldn't have. And, and uh, the people voted. Oh. <laughs> it happens. But it's good. I learned. So This was a big rejection to take yeah. as a 20-year-old. What were the thoughts that went through your head? Like, was that a small giant to slay? Was it... How big of a deal was that? You know, doing Idol a couple years, um, I feel like the first year, we didn't quite make it as far, got cut right before the live shows. So it was around top 40. And that was the harder pill to swallow for me. Okay. Um, ego was a thing for me. Pride was definitely creeping in. It had more than creeped in. It, it had made its, <laughs> made its home, you know, in my head. Um, but um, that was a tough thing to swallow. So walking through that summer, thinking I deserve to be there over this person or this person or whatever, and God working on that in me. Mm -hmm. we, we just, we serve a really good God and a gracious God and, and still in spite of our, whatever we have going on internally, still wants to bless us. Um, I think sometimes his timing um, is longer than we hope, um, but uh, I think he's keeping things from us intentionally because we're not ready. Uh, and in that moment, I wasn't ready. So it took another season of me going deeper in my relationship with God and Him showing me things and, and getting my pride and ego in check. Mm. And, and uh, it's not a fun thing to walk through, but it was necessary for me because He knew what was to come. Okay, pride and ego is a major giant, right? Yeah, like it was a big just thing, yeah. Period. Candy, yeah. You know, you have a good hair day and you're like, toss, toss. Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe your hair's a little shorter than mine. But you know, so, you so have... it's more like twist, twist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you have a good fit day and you're like feeling yourself, right? Yeah, yeah. And just like, so any particular day, like ego and pride can be just this huge sabotaging giant throughout life. How does a 19 year old wrangle that? Man, I can't attribute it to one thing over another. Um, I'm thankful for God's grace and patience through it all because I didn't get it right most of the time, <laughs> um, especially being that young, um, 31 now, and and uh, looking back, you know, even just at outfit or hair choices, be like, <laughs> man, I thought I had it going on. Oh. It's like, Lord have mercy, that's gonna go in a book somewhere. You cannot <laughs> judge an not outfit 10 years later ever. I mean, <laughs> you just can't. <laughs> yeah, it's brutal. Um, but. Uh, I'm, I'm also thankful that I was taught to rely on his voice in, in the sea of noise that I was in um, to look and hear, tune your ear to that still small voice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it's David or anyone else in the Bible, I think you realized really quickly they weren't doing it on their own strength and they weren't doing it uh, in their own uh, capacity. And it same is true for me. Um, I wouldn't have done what I have done up until this point if it wasn't for God in my life. 
Facing giants alone, it can be terrifying. You may be facing a giant today, and if you are, I'm really glad you're here because I believe this conversation can encourage you because we haven't even really gotten into, so we got cut from a show. Okay, you've never been on a show, got it. No, he's faced a lot of things that are more serious than that, like the pulse of his baby not being there. We're gonna talk about that. I don't know what Goliath is in front of you, but if there's a Goliath in front of you, God sees a David inside of you. And I think even more than a David because the word says greater is he that is in you. That'd be the spirit of God that is in you than he that is in the world. That's right. There's a David inside of you. There's a spirit of God inside of you. So whatever you're facing, you're going to triumph. God is not obligated to heal a hurt that you won't give him. And I know you feel like you're at a fork in the road right now, but God is here to meet you. I'm here to tell you that your past does not determine your future. Your past prepares you for your future. And, and I know because I've been in the pain where I thought I should just survive. I remember finding out that I was adopted by my dad. I remember being molested when I was in fourth grade, raped when I was 13, bullied by the kids in school, and becoming a single unwed mother at 17 years old. I remember what it felt like when I married the man of my dreams and I thought he was one thing, he became drug addicted and I got foreclosed on. I was bankrupt, divorced and a single mom again. My life should have been a statistic and you might feel the same way about yours, but you're not called to survive, you're called to thrive. I just finished the first chapter of I Will Thrive and can I tell you, I could not put it down. It was so good. It was captivating, inspiring. I wrote down quotes. You've got to read it. God wants to take you to the promise, the future that he has for you that is so good and so wonderful. A thriving future, not based on what has happened, but based on his plans for you. He just needs you to take one step out. And that's why I want you to get this book today. I want you to go to the website, get this book, hold it near and dear to your heart and step out in life and thrive. I'm gonna give you three points, three ways to slay a giant. So you might wanna grab your phone, grab a pencil, grab something. If you're facing something big in your life, I'm gonna tell you how to get out of it. And number one is don't listen to the people who have never done what you wanna do. So in 1 Samuel 17, it talks about David. David, he's the youngest of eight children. Um, the oldest three boys were at war. The other boys, uh, they were out doing things. And David, he wanted to be at war so bad. I mean, and it's not the first time he was left out in life. When a prophet came to their house, his name was Samuel, to anoint the next king of Israel, the prophet knew it was at this house and he asked his dad, Jesse, bring all your boys. I need to find one of them. One of them's gonna be king. Jesse didn't show him eight boys, he showed him seven. He left David out on the back of a hill. He was left out. That giant, whew, daddy issues. I'm telling you what, that's bigger than any nine foot giant that stood in front of him with a sword trying to fight him. Sure enough, Samuel tried to pray. He's like, it's none of these boys. Jesse, I told you to bring all your boys. I'm sure you, you brought all your boys, but like, do you have another one somewhere? It's a weird question. I mean, how called on the carpet did Jesse feel? How stupid, how foolish. I mean, I hope he did because he left one of his sons out in the field. And sure enough, He's like, I, I, I got one more. So David walks up and you know the other boys told him the story. Huh. Dad called for all the boys, but he didn't call you. Don't listen to people who've never done what you're called to do. So the boys are at war and David is stuck at home. His dad says, hey, I want you to come bring him some cheese sandwiches. David's like, man, what am I, Uber Eats? Dad, I can do this, send me in. He's like, nope, just take him the sandwiches. So he takes him the sandwiches, and when he gets there, his older brother, Eliab, says, what are you doing here? You causing trouble? It says Eliab burned with anger. David just shows up, and he's got somebody beating him down and trying to keep him down. Your family might not be supporting your dream. Your friends might not be supporting your dream. Your spouse might not be supporting your dream. You're going to have to slay that giant. David did it, you can too. I mean, when I talk to people about David and Goliath, they're all like, I've heard the story. I'm like, we've heard the story, but when we hear the story, we only think about one giant, and that's the one we can see in the flesh. And I know you, and I know my life, and your biggest giant life probably isn't a person. 
It's probably your self-doubt. It's probably your lack of confidence. It's probably the enemy telling you every day you can't, you're not enough. It's probably a health report. It's probably finances. It's probably a lack of knowledge, but it's not one person. That's the least of your problems. Don't listen to people who've never done what you're called to do. So David gets out there. He goes and he sees it and King Saul comes and says, hey, you're saying that you want to slay this giant. Let me give you my armor. Number two, don't go into a war with weapons that aren't yours. You see, when you go into a war with a weapon that's not yours, you don't know how to use it. You don't know how to yield it. You don't know how to push it. You don't know how to thrust it. It might have looked smart to put on some armor to go fight a big giant. It might have looked smart to grab a sword and go fight a giant. But it's not what he was used to. What I'm telling you right now is don't change your methods. Don't change your uniqueness. Don't change who you are. If you're a Christian, stay a Christian. But I'm in an organization that wants me to lie, cheat, and steal. Stay a Christian. Stick to your values. Be who you are. I'm in an organization and they want me to, to bend and change. No, it's your 2% uniqueness that makes you special. And if you do what they told you to do, you're going to be like everybody else and be where everybody else is. What are you called to do? How are you called to do it? Are you called to kill a giant with a sling? If you are, sling, baby, sling. And number three, increase your own courage by creating tangible rewards. You might be thinking, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. They're big, I'm small, that's the boss, I'm the worker, that's cancer, I'm a statistic, uh, that's my zip code, this is where everybody lands. No, 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 no. You have to create some tangible rewards. So when David was going to fight Goliath, that's what he did. Uh, the king said, here's what you get. If you do this thing, you're gonna pay no taxes. You're gonna marry my daughter. You're gonna leave, you're gonna live in the king's castle. He's gonna get all these things. So David's like, okay, I live in the king's castle. I get to marry his daughter and I pay no taxes. Okay, okay, okay. Um, he goes up there because he's gonna go fight Goliath and he asks the question, what do I get again? You're gonna get healed and you're gonna get a clean bill of health. You're gonna start your own business and you're gonna make so much money, you're gonna be as generous as you wanna be and it's not gonna affect you at all. <laughs> You're gonna get recognized and leveled up for being that person that isn't everybody else, for being that person who has scruples, for being that person that God created you to be. The very thing that makes you awkward in this season is the exact thing that makes you perfect for the next season. God has not given you a spirit of fear. That's why I'm here to remind you of that, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. In and of yourself, you might not be able to do this, but you're anointed, you're appointed, and you're called by God. Now go slay that giant. If you have fought all your life and you kept going, but now you feel like, hey, I'm gonna quit because I feel like discouraged, somebody broken my heart, but I'm telling you, don't quit. Quitting is not an answer to a problem. To keep fighting is the answer to a problem because we are a problem solver. We have to remind ourselves though that the enemy is gonna try to stop you from accomplishing your purpose because your purpose isn't just for you. It's not gonna just help you. It's gonna help so many other people. But remember that when he gave you the purpose, he also gave you everything you're gonna need. He's gonna equip you to accomplish that purpose. If you have been thinking about giving up, I've got advice for you. Don't. So this morning in my bathroom while I was trying to curl the one extension I have in my head because the other one broke. Um, I love the honesty. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I'm jamming out in my bathroom here in Nashville to uh, Miracles. Because it's a fun pumping song. It is a fun song. It gets it you is. going. Bow, bow, bow. About like 28 million streams. It's wild. Congrats. I haven't been keeping up, but that's wild. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you very much. As a songwriter, be careful what you write about um, <laughs> because you might need it later. And uh, you're right, this song um, kind of was conceived by this thought like, man, miracles happen around us every single day, but we're just too naive or ignorant to notice. My wife was pregnant in 2020, crazy year for a lot of reasons. Um, it was kind of a blessing <laughs> in disguise for us. I was home, I would have been on the road and got to walk with her through that pregnancy season and 
got to meet my girls and and uh, but girls. it was so. girls plural yes identical <laughs> twin girls pray for us the um, Lord has judged you <laughs> <laughs> no it's blessing we take it as blessing big time and uh, we love it but at um, at the birth um, there was a scare that happened uh, when Dior came out, we had to switch to emergency C-section. And, and when Dior came out, she wasn't breathing and didn't have a pulse. And not the way you want to meet your kid for the first time, right? The body kind of felt numb. Yeah. Um, things felt like it was going in slow motion. Uh, I just remember the color of Dior. I just knew the color of her skin wasn't right. And so they, they brought her to our left and started working on her trying to resuscitate her. And then Athens came out kicking and screaming. So that was almost a sigh of relief. We knew she was okay. Yeah. So we got to divert our attention back on Dior. And it literally was just, it was almost like sticky note cards, like faith or fear. It was just like, wow. Um, fear seemed like the more logical choice. Yeah. It's like, yeah, of course we're supposed to be fearful in this moment. Um, but having scripture brought to my remembrance, like God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love and a sound mind. And, and that song that I had just written, you know, it's like, I do believe that God still does miracles. It's not just an Old Testament thing. Yeah. It's a today thing, yeah. you know? Um, so I believe that He can. So we're going to stand and believe that He will, you know? And uh, so we started praying. And this Southern Baptist boy started praying in tongues and, <laughs> and all kinds of stuff. It was awesome. Um, but, you know, I, we just believed that it was going to be okay. And uh, whether God touched her directly or works through the doctors and nurses, uh, Dior started breathing and spent about a week in the NICU just to monitor, um, had a little bit of jaundice, um, but she's good, happy, healthy. She's our miracle baby and we're so grateful. So in the, in the room where she was born, where the doctors were working on her, do you remember, did you pray in your head? Do you pray out loud? Do you even remember what you did? In I think moment? it was a combination of both. Yeah. Like I said, every time felt so slow. Right. Um, and of course, Annie was, was all there. She was praying as well and was checking on her, making sure she was okay. And just, there was a lot happening. Yeah. But. Um, and do you feel a little helpless because Annie's actually birthing them? So you see your wife having a cesarean, you see your babies being born, and your doctors are moving. Yeah, you kind of feel like, it's like, I, I know I like have a place here, but as far as like actually <laughs> doing something, it's like, all right, my job right now is to pray. That's my job right here in the room. An important job. Important job. And at the moment, it was, it was one of the most important jobs. And uh, it, was a, it was a scary time. But I think out of scary moments, your faith has the opportunity to grow yeah. when, the, when it's tested. And that was a big testing moment for us that we're able to look back and, and say, thank you, God, for coming through. And, and it just adds, adds that fuel to that fire of our faith. Well, and I, I think I heard you say something. When you felt helpless, you prayed. And I think that's a great point for people who, who don't have that tool in their tool chest yet. When I feel helpless, what do I do? I, I feel helpless. Yeah, I think so often we think faith as a last resort or prayer as a last resort, and it should be our knee-jerk reaction. Come on. Um, like if that was the first thing that we ran to, like how different, even if your scenario didn't look any different, how different would you feel on the inside? Like, would you have more peace about it? Probably, yeah. you know, give it a try and let me know. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, I know the times where I've ran to it first, I, th there's just been a supernatural peace over the situation, mm -hmm. even if it doesn't change anything in the natural, like there's something supernatural happening on the inside of me. So yeah, it's good. In just a minute, I'm gonna have Colton pray for you. I've had so many wild and crazy things happen in my life. Mm -hmm and I really should have run to God with it, but I either felt bad about it, I was confused about it, I was ashamed. I, I, I guess I didn't know how to be vulnerable with God. And so I had all these things I needed to say to God, all these things I needed His help on, and yet I, I couldn't come to Him. And I hated that. Well, it took me time, but I finally got through it. And what I started doing is I started writing down when I was mad, when I was embarrassed, when I was ashamed, when I felt unloved, when I felt overlooked. And I wrote down these prayers that I prayed when I told God, hey God, it's me again. I don't know what to do right now, but I know that I can trust you. And if you've ever been in a place where you wanted to talk to God, but you didn't know how to talk to him about your kids, about being lonely, about your finances, this book 
is for you. I want you to have a breakthrough in your prayer life. I got one more thing. If you guys haven't bought it yet, check it out. It is a must read, it's a must buy, and it's my favorite book. Please check it out. For just $1, you can download Hi God, One More Thing. <laughs> Where you can say, Hi God, it's me again. I need to talk to you about these things. I started out in the pain, but I take you to the promise in just 90 seconds. I give you scriptures, you can research, and you can get a breakthrough. I don't want you to miss this opportunity to talk to God on a level that's gonna bring breakthrough in your life. Go get this book today. God will use whatever you have in your hand to slay the giants in your life. I know fear's coming up, but whenever fear comes, boom, you gotta choose faith. You gotta give God your trust, give Him your gifts, give Him your skills, and let Him fill in the gaps. I know you go to the store of the gap, you don't think about God, but I do because I go to the store of the gap and I think, yep, he is my gap filler. He is the reason I can face my giants with confidence. And I'm telling you what, I have to step out in monstrous faith every single week. It costs thousands and thousands of dollars every single week to take this show and put it out. We put it out in Iran to women who are in Burkas and Suppressed. We put it out in the Philippines, we're in Pakistan, we're in Australia, we're all across America. We're on secular stations, we're on Christian stations. We have one or two stations that are so gracious to put us on for free. And we pay a lot of money to reach people in their homes who are hurting, they're facing giants, and they need somebody next to them. They need a coach next to them saying, hey, get up, you're not here by yourself. God's with you and I'm with you. And the only reason I can do that is because of you. When you give a gift to the ministry or you join the Circle of Friends, Circle of Friends, it's a high value partnership. That means I do Zoom calls with you. That means I send you emails. <laughs> but more importantly, the $27.77 a month, it's a partnership, it's a seed. It helps us do the mission we're called to do. And I can honestly tell you, I don't take a single penny. I get no salary for doing this. I am passionate about reaching people where they are, taking them from the pain to the promise. And I wanna invite you to do that. So would you join my circle of friends right now? Go to NicoleCrank.com forward slash circle. Or if you're like, I'm not a circle of friends kind of person. God's just put it on my heart. I just need to send $99 one time. Or I believe, I've been believing God for chunks. I believe there's a few chunks out there that are supposed to be sent. And if that's you, you can go to NicoleCrank.com forward slash donate. And now Colton's gonna pray for you. God, I just speak directly to everyone who tuned in. Um, God, maybe they're facing giants of their own. I pray that you just stir up that David inside of them and you just reassure them that greater is he who is inside of them than he who is in the world. Um, they're capable, uh, they're strong, um, they're chosen, they're royalty. Um, you you give, give us that identity, we're thankful for that. So God, I just speak over the people um, that they rise to the occasion, that they choose faith over fear. And uh, again, we thank you for this amazing time pray you bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. What's the craziest thing that's ever happened? She gets artists to sign this plastic kidney. She's like, can you sign my kidney? My kidney. 